Pick up the last three three questions you raised. Very important, which in fact uh, converge and overlap with uh, Dr. Sumsky's uh, main points and Dr. Sherman's uh, main argument. And that is, uh, you know, and this is something also for the ambassador. I mean, how credible is this? Go east. Uh, India has a look east. You know, for 20 years, 20 odd years, and it's trying to follow up. It's making some concrete plans. You know, and under Modi, I think it's more credible. And then. Uh, how sustainable in the longer term, uh, having credibility, but it also has to be sustained. And that would be based on, is there a consensus in Russia that this is the, the new orientation? Is this where you want to go, really? Or is this a, a reaction to the Western sanctions and uh, the Western pressure, and therefore a short-term uh, phenomenon? Once the Western sanctions and pressure ease, uh, Russia will go west again. Russia was in World War One, World War Two, going back 300 years. It's you know has a Western orientation. So those are very valid questions in the end, uh, Boon. And it goes to Dr. Sherman's point about eventually, perhaps, what we're seeing the Russian turning east is a temporary phenomenon. Now, ASEAN. I want to come back to ASEAN. You know, we can really only talk about ASEAN as ASEAN. Uh, in a recent, in the second half of ASEAN, I mean, ASEAN has been around 48 years. The first half of its life uh, was divided. It was not a real ASEAN. It was just uh, a few five member states and then uh, plus one Brunei. ASEAN was divided. Southeast Asia was divided. It only came together after, uh, you know, as the Cold War dissipated in the late 1980s, beginning with the Socialist Republic of Vietnam's withdrawal from Cambodia leading eventually to the Cambodian um, informal meetings, peace talks, and the election in Cambodia in 1993, in May 1993. After that, you had uh, Vietnam coming as ASEAN member, and then uh, Myanmar, Burma then, Myanmar, 1997, then uh, Laos, Cambodia, and ASEAN became 10 countries only after 1999. So it's a recent, you know, ASEAN as ASEAN as we know it, uh, it's more recent, only the second half of its life. Now, ASEAN has to U.S. treaty allies, Philippines and Thailand. Uh, so this is very important because in the maritime domain, you were seeing more attention in the South China Sea. The Philippines is leaning more on the U.S. and the United States is becoming more uh, assertive or perhaps uh, more engaged, if you will. Uh, having fallen behind, the U.S. has fallen behind its own pivot strategy uh, because of other crises elsewhere. Uh, now it's maybe trying to catch up. Uh, and here I think where Russia can uh, may be able to play a role because uh, if the Russia-Vietnam ties are boosted, you know, if they are elevated, uh, that will provide a new dynamic in, in the maritime domain of Southeast Asia because then China would have uh, uh, Russia in, in Vietnam and Russia could even perhaps uh, uh, ease some of the tension in the South China Sea with this uh, role and, and with this relationship with Vietnam. So, a lot to discuss. Now I want to turn the floor over to the participants, to, the, to all of you. If you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand, keep them short. We have about 15-20 minutes. I was living in Moscow in the early 1990s. I do not uh, go with the notion that the Russian Federation is being pushed into the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, there was much big debates in the early 1990s in Moscow whether the new Russian Federation would be a European power or a Eurasian power. And I think the consensus at that time was a Eurasian power. But of course, the emphasis was more towards the West and so on. But at the same time, the Russian Federation or the Soviet Union before that has been a long-time member of the UNSCAT. 
and as the uh, Russian Federation, it joined the ARF and became the uh, dialogue partner of ASEAN. So it has always been that the interest be, uh, has always been towards the Asia Pacific, but it was not substantive for the very one simple reason that whether it was the Soviet government or the Russian government, you keep on exporting only one product, military hardware, in spite of the fact that you have so much of the scientific and technological advancement and so on. If that were to be put into good uses, I think there would have been more substances to the Russia relations towards each of the ASEAN country and also to the ASEAN community as a whole. So, so you are not being pushed back. I think the emphasis was wrong from the beginning. Keep on selling mix and submarines and aircraft carriers and so on. It would not bode well for, for Russia. So that should be more on the economic front of it. And then that will, I think what Professor Boon just mentioned, the substance, the credibility would be on what technologies and scientific achievement Russia would have and whether that would be put into good uses. I think that's the, the one point that I just want to to, to, to emphasize. The second one on, on, the, on this multipolar situation, one is the China, the United States, Russia and India. I would like to propose the fourth pillar, namely the ASEAN community. We cannot keep on telling ASEAN whether it would be leaning towards which the other four powers. I think that's not right. And unless and until the ASEAN political leadership come together and make ASEAN as a pillar to be reconciled with and stand, I think, at the same level, on the same level platform as the other four major players in the Asia Pacific. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm a publisher here. Uh, I have some, uh, what shall I say, criticism about the Russians. Uh, there are uh, quite some East Europeans, they are genuinely afraid of, of Russia. And, uh, and I think the Russians didn't do enough uh, to be accepted in, in uh, Western Europe. Uh, so they uh, I mean, from the, from the past, uh, they're, is, they're afraid. And, uh, you know, we Europeans are exploited and looted by the Americans. Uh, when I hear some remarks uh, from Putin, I can rather identify with this culturally than with uh, what comes out of out of America. If the Russians want to be fully accepted in in Europe, uh, why not come with a gift? Why not give uh, Prussia back to Germany and break uh, Germany away from the strong alliance? Or uh, I mean, the Germans are just caddies of America and give them incentives to rethink their policy. And if German uh, as a central state in Europe uh, would uh, uh, change their mind, uh, the others would uh, probably also rethink it. And the, if uh, Prussia is given back, at least part of Prussia, uh, the, the Baltic states may also change their mind and see that Russia would not be uh, ag aggressive anymore, whether it is or not, but that is in the perception. And then some islands, if, if Russia would give back uh, some islands north of uh, Japan, which uh, they took uh, uh, at the end of the war, uh, the, uh, then Russia can show we are a new Russia. And I believed or hoped that uh, Russia would be the California for Europe, the gold rush. Because uh, number one, I believe, I, I regard Russians as Europeans, uh, 100%. I, I think we have more in common with Russia uh, or the Russians than we have with, with uh, Greece, uh, uh, with all the differences. And uh, I would say Russia would need expertise and money from Europe and uh, integrate. Uh, what I agree is that Russia would, uh, uh, the alliance with China would be temporary. Uh, China expanded for a thousand years to the south. 
but uh, China has a population problem. And who would uh, predict or why should China not also later on expand to the north? So, so I think China, uh, uh, Russia would need Europe and Europe would need uh, uh, Russia to get because we are closer culturally than we are with, uh, with America. Thank you. Please tell us your affiliation before you. Oh, yes, I, I teach at uh, Mahidon University, but I, I spent 10 years in the British diplomatic service, including four in Moscow. Uh, you expressed, Dr. Sumsky, with exceptional clarity the view that Russia has given up on a 300 year attempt to become part of the West. Uh, if that's true, that is a historic departure. I just wanted to ask, is that your personal view and the view of the Institute, or would you say that expresses a broader expert and political consensus in Moscow now? Now, Dr. Koldunova, you made some very interesting remarks about the, the problems and opportunities that Russia's eastward turn offers for the development of the, the vast potential in, uh, in the Asian, uh, giant Asian body of Russia. And as uh, uh, Mr. Nagara pointed out, of course, nearly all of Russia's territory lies there. Most of the population in, in the Western head, most of the resources in the Asian body. That will require enormous investments to unlock. I've long thought that this could be the Siberian century, such as the potential there. These are not in easy or accessible or hospitable climates. They will require lots and lots of investment. Where will that come from? And, and finally, just on the broader theme of Russian-China relations uh, and how those might differ from Russia-EU relations, there has been a view in Russia, at least until recently, that the EU is a sort of slabi igrok, yes, a weak player, uh, committed to soft postmodern power, less than some of its parts, easily dividable. None of those is true of China. China is likely to be a much tougher partner than the EU. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on that point as well. Thank you. A panel a gathering of eminent uh, experts on uh, Russia and Europe and Asia. Um, I think this is a good attempt to redress. So tell us you're from oh, the... I'm yeah. sorry, I do apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm from the Foreign Ministry, but I'm, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, of course. Um, I, I think that this seminar is a good attempt to redress the, the imbalance in the sense that, um, I mean, we in Asia ourselves, we, we've, we've tended to neglect Russia. I mean, we, we haven't, I mean, we, there's much talk about Russia not, not uh, uh, talking much about Asia or not uh, being knowledgeable about Asia, but we in Asia ourselves have, have been uh, lacking knowledge about Russia too. So I think it's this a two-way street. And uh, so this, this, this seminar is a good attempt to re redress this imbalance. And um, uh, two points. Um, the first is about the Russian-China relationship. Um, it's, I think it's unavoidable that, that Russia's eastward pivot to Asia would, would, would be sinocentric. I mean, it's given the long history, the long borders that they, they share together. So uh, it's, it's unavoidable, it's inevitable, and it's very much understandable. And uh, whether or not this is good or not uh, is, is, is something that we have to question. But one could easily argue, too, that a Russian-Chinese um, strategic partnership and close friendship is a better thing than, than having a conflict between these two major powers. And um, you can easily look back into history during the Sino-Soviet conflict and uh, the, when these two major powers clashed and there was the regional repercussions even in, in, in Southeast Asia. So one could easily argue that uh, maybe this is a good thing, that there's stability in, 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 in Northeast Asia. Uh, my second point, uh, question mainly is about um, Russian strategic thinking towards Southeast Asia. I mean, I haven't heard a lot about that. I mean, you, you do mention ASEAN and, and some particular countries like Vietnam, um, but how does Russia approach Southeast Asia? Do you have a a particular uh, strategy or entry point into 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 this sub-region. Uh, one would assume that Vietnam would be an obvious candidate because you have good relations with that. But how would that expand or 
uh, how would you follow up on that into the wider sub-region, into other ASEAN countries? And the diplomatic tools, the, the foreign policy tools that you may have. I mean, there's, there's talk about military, military arms and uh, energy, of course. You know, the former foreign minister talked about um, science and technology, which is a, a very much um, a great potential that I think should be emphasized too. Thank you. Uh, mainly Russia, EU, Russia, China, Russia, ASEAN. And uh, do you actually have the Russian strategy? Is there a co cohesive, coherent, long-term strategic outlook and strategic plans for engaging in the, in the East? Uh, so we'll, who would like to go first? Maybe Dr. Ekaterina? Thank you very much. Uh, well, actually, all the questions were really brilliant. Uh, with, um, my judgment is that once I want to answer immediately, it means that uh, the questions are good. Um, uh, so, um, starting with the point about um, ma made by Dr. Nigel about uh, the difference between um, the negotiation and diplomatic uh, culture um, in Russia's re relations with China and in the, EU, the EU. Well, I don't think that actually the European Union is a weak player. Uh, uh, it's just the um, the entity which has many uh, many participants, and that makes uh, the um, divergence of uh, visions inside the EU, the EU um, actually quite visible. Uh, but as for as for China, you know that um, uh, I would I would argue that uh, actually we, we can we can manage negotiations with China because we had a, a many century long history of, of dealing with China. Uh, what is different, of course, is that now China is um, in, in, in a different position. Uh, we used to have the situation when uh, the USSR was a stronger player, the, the China was a weaker one. Of course, the negotiations, uh, the, the talks, the, uh, the relations uh, were in, an, in a different capacity at that time. But now, well, we, we have to get used to, to, to a stronger China as a partner, as a negotiator, as a country uh, which ha has its own um, interests uh, in the regional dimension, in the global dimension. Uh, but we, we have to, to live with it uh, and we have to, to make the best of it. As for um, uh, the investments for uh, the Far Eastern development, Development. Uh, there is a, a very long debate uh, in, in the Russian society how we should do this because you know we, we had uh, strong hopes that uh, Europe can help uh, now some part of the elite has strong hopes that China uh, will come and build everything in, in our far east uh, but actually the reality uh, tells us that uh, only Russia can do something about developing Russia and we have uh, different examples like uh, northern uh, Arctic Sea Route etc uh, but actually if you look at it from a different perspective, if a country uh, can afford a huge, well, mega projects, mega infrastructure, infrastructural projects like uh, we uh, we can afford uh, the Trans-Siberian Railroad renovation, uh, the uh, space launching site in uh, in Amur region, the new space launching uh, site, and and some others, then uh, it's it's also an indication uh, of uh, well of a kind of strength in fact. So the debate is uh, what should actually Russia do about its stabilization fund, about uh, its money uh, accumulated uh, accumulated during the good years of high oil prices, whether we should save. Some say, uh, some uh, economists say we should save. Uh, uh, well, uh, actually, if we have a doomsday, then we will uh, have something to live on further, uh, or we should spend. And if actually, uh, and I uh, do agree uh, with the second uh, camp, uh, so to say, if we if we spend on. Um, bringing up uh, the, this regions economically, then it will show clearly, even for uh, the East, uh, Eastern Europeans, uh, who, some of them are afraid of us, that uh, we are not imperialists. We are uh, actually trying to develop our own uh, territory and we are not going, you know, that Russians are not coming um, as, as some uh, are, afraid, are still afraid of. And just uh, briefly reacting to the question of mistrust. You know, I, I can partly agree that you know overlooking the interests and concerns of uh, smaller states uh, is is quite dangerous, and we see this situation happening in in Southeast Asia, uh, with, in the relations between Southeast Asia and China. You cannot continuously overlook uh, the interests and concerns of your uh, well, uh, smaller 
geographically, not uh, of course economically or politically part. If you if you overlook it, you will have a dangerous situation like uh, South China Sea issue dispute now. Uh, this refers to Russia's relations with the Eastern European countries. But on the other hand, you, you say uh, the gentleman stated that Russia should make uh, should make a shift. If you look at uh, the situation of 1990s, Russia has sacrificed a lot. And what actually troubled Russia and is troubling Russia a lot is that not that, uh, you know, that uh, a bad authoritarian state is trying to keep its position. No, the Russian people itself rejected the authoritarian system of the, US, uh, of the Soviet period uh, as, uh, as a stalemate in its development. And having done so and being uh, treated like a secondary um, Secondary people in Europe, in, in the world, uh, doesn't bring much, uh, you know, positive uh, feelings at all. Uh, having done that, uh, well, actually, our political elite genuinely believed uh, that it will be accepted, or well, if not accepted, but treated as, uh, if not an equal, but as, as a normal, uh, well, actually, a nation which which wanted, uh, really wanted to to get integrated, to participate. Uh, but we we got uh, a, a very well uh, mixed. Mixed result. Thank you. Russia's uh, close relations with China is something that's very logical and natural, and therefore to be expected. Uh, it's good for both countries, and I don't think that's a problem uh, for other countries. Um, I don't think for countries like Malaysia it's a problem. Uh, China is not a problem. Russia is not a problem. I don't think it's a problem for the region as well. Although some countries may see it that way, so it's more a matter of uh, perception. Uh, where there's a kind of a problem, but I don't think in reality there is. Unfortunately, in Asia, a lot depends on perceptions, uh, because perceptions can shape and color policies, and action can cause reactions, reactions can cause counter-reactions, and so on. So uh, the, I would emphasize the need to be careful, to be aware, uh, and to know the sensibilities, to understand the sensitivities, and to work accordingly. Uh, so I think uh, for the good of all countries, because I think it's more a win-win-win situation rather than an uh, exclusive, uh, you know, zero-sum game. Uh, thank you. Okay, win-win-win. Um, sounds good to me. Nathan, it's okay. So, um, Dr. Shemant? Uh, I'll be very brief, actually. I'm just responding to the view that uh, Russia was pushed to the east. I agree that Russia obviously has natural interests in forging relationships with its, uh, with its Far Eastern region and the Asia Pacific more, more widely. Uh, my point was that, uh, and Putin made it himself actually, we have alternatives. And what we're leading to now is the possibility for the first time since the 1950s of a, a real proper working strategic alliance between China and Russia. Uh, I think the prospects are probably slim, but nevertheless they are, they are real. Um, but to come back to, and it's an odd thing for me to come back to to conclude on, because really I'm a realist, but, but the politics of identity. Uh, in the United Kingdom, there's been an election recently, uh, or what we might now call the disunited kingdom, uh, and the result of that election will be a referendum, probably now next year, where Britain itself may pull out of the, of the European Union, uh, with all kinds of consequences for the integration, further integration of Europe, they could have wide spillover effects if it happens. And I think it's likely to happen. Uh, unfortunately, in 1975, I voted to stay when we had a referendum the last time around. But the point is, uh, the politics of identity are important, and this reflects in Britain, even though the British Empire collapsed a long time ago, uh, you know, the Brits are still, or the English, should we say now, uh, the Scottish and the Welsh and the Northern Irish are unsure where they belong in the world. Churchill's three circles of influence, you know, is it a special relationship with the United States? Uh, is it part of Europe? Or is it the old empire? You know, is it the, the Commonwealth? And Britain's still not sure where it actually sits. Um, all we can say is that they are very reluctant Europeans. Now, Russia, um, like I said before, suddenly their empire disappeared overnight. Uh, so it's not, surely, a surprise that, that Russia should be in an uncertain situation in terms of its identity. And my view is that its, its logical, rational uh, identity is being part of a wider Europe. Uh, culturally, historically, in terms of literature and the arts and architecture, um, 
Kerry once said uh, when the crisis in Ukraine was happened, the Russians are acting like 19th century um, uh, aggressors. Well, the 19th century, after the Napoleonic Wars, was a time of peace. It was a time of, uh, of the Congress system, uh, where Russia was a part of diplomacy through the balance of power with the European states. A conservative power, yes, as it is indeed now a conservative power. It's more of a, it's more of a, um, uh, an upholder of the old conception of sovereignty than, than the Western states are themselves going back to Westphalia. It's more of a Westphalian state, more of a Western state than the Western states are. So I think that the, uh, the, the push, and in terms of ASEAN, just very quickly, if you look at the trade statistics, there's very little. I think Russia ranks about 15th or below 15th in, in most of the ASEAN states in terms of uh, trade partners. That's a big trade with China. Uh, but I really don't think that the, the strategic alliance with China will eventually materialize and Russia will eventually go back with a Western oriented uh, focus. Thank you. Uh, 21st century realists can talk about and should talk about identity. Uh, talk about identity, you know, I'm going to give the last word to Dr. Sumsky. 300 odd years ago, um, Peter the Great, Russians, I think the, the other, the identity formation, the Western orientation was probably, you know, they, they stood up to the Ottomans at that time. And I think that uh, it built into a kind of a orientation towards the West with up, a lot of ups and downs. Uh, so last word, is it East or West or is it Eurasian? I think it is Eurasian, but the important thing is that the, Euro the European element is definitely there. And we are not negating the achievements of our own culture. This all will, will be forever with us. But the problem is that uh, the kind of treatment that we were given during the last several years should not be underestimated. I mean, it bordered on, it, well, uh, it is characterized as a, as a, um, as a kind of war, short of, short of going into, into real military action. All the other components of war are there. And, it, and it's, uh, here I, I want to remember the title of a recent publica one recent publication, The Cold War. It is, it is worse in some ways than the Cold War itself. So uh, I, I would not like to represent myself as the voice of Russia here when I say that, uh, that uh, Russia is, is disengaging with, with the West in terms of wishing to be a part of it. But, but I think that this is, this is uh, the opinion of a serious part of, of, a, of a significant part of Russian society and of, of Russian expert community too. Uh, how sustainable is this would move? Uh, I don't want to say much about it. I just want to quote President Putin, who said in one of his recent addresses that this is Russia's national project for the whole of the 21st century. It, it is not something that is going to happen in the course of a decade or, or, or even in a, in a longer run. This, this is a long time project. And I think that, you know, whenever, whenever you, you talk about projects like this, the first question is, who will implement it? I would say that even five years ago or so, uh, there was no clear-cut answer to this question. But now, if you look at the list of Russian companies, which are already big ones, not, not, not the middle and the, and the small businesses, which are already deeply involved or are going to be involved with uh, Asia, in particular in the, in, in the energy sector. I think uh, are, they form a very strong base for, for this Asian lobby, if you wish. There is a, a whole group of uh, top politicians and statesmen of, of the ministerial level who are now forming the core of, of this group, which is intent to promote Russia's eastward turn. And, and of course, the, the figure of President Putin is not to be discounted. So uh, I, we, we do not have time for a longer discussion, and so much was already said on the subject. I just want to register my opinion on, on this first question of uh, the sustainability of Eastwood Move and the seriousness of our 
disengagement with the West in the sense which I described. Uh, although I want, I want to say that disengagement with the United States is, is still more serious than with Europe. With Europe, something will be repaired, but not all. With the United States, it is more serious. And I think that if so far it has not occurred to them that they're making a mistake by pushing Russia and China closer together, I, I'm not sure that they will, that they will uh, quickly come to the conclusion they sh they, that they should change something. Don't be misled by recent visits by Kerry and Nuland. They are not an indication that Russia is changing anything in its approach, even, even if Americans will make certain hints. Russia-China, I have not used one key word which has to be used in a discussion of Russia-China relations and of Russia's eastward movement in general, diversification. Russia-China combination will not work in case it is not accompanied by a similar development of cooperation along other lines, like, like the ones mentioned here. India, well, to some extent Japan, to some extent Korea, uh, but also ASEAN, of course, and in ASEAN, Vietnam was correctly mentioned, but, but I would not single out just Vietnam. There are other, uh, there are others, uh, very promising, um, promising partners. Uh, Russia and China will never see everything eye to eye. And, and this is, in general, the nature of big power relationships. But if China and Russia have bigger objectives than just doing things doing things together i think uh, you know eurasian integration is is uh, eurasia pacific integration is is one of them i think that's a sufficient indication that that the relationship can be can be cemented and it will not be something something lasting although i do not exclude ups and downs russia asian uh, I have said already something about the need to diversify Russia's Asian policy in general, and, and this applies very much to ASEAN. But also, uh, Russia-ASEAN relationship itself has to be diversified. Uh, I would like to say that uh, whatever, whatever may be stated about the low levels of trade turnover, this relationship is no longer a one-dimensional one in the sense that you know it boils down to military trade it, you, you now see the formation of a stronger fabric of russia as a relationship irrespective of the trade numbers in terms of people to people you know uh, those of you who can speak and read russian just explore that part of internet in russian which deals with uh, various aspects of life in Southeast Asia and relationships between, uh, on a people-to-people -people basis between, between Russia and, and Southeast Asia, you will be amazed. You will be amazed by the number of internet publications and by the number of print publications in these countries itself in Russian for the Russians living, living in these countries and explaining these countries. I think this is what Boon is calling for explaining these countries to the Russians who live there, so that so that they behave in a in a, in a wiser and uh, and more prudent way. Uh, I can't help but react to some observations by Boon. You know, when I started listening to him uh, and to his requirements, list list of requirements to Russia, what Russia should do and what Russia shouldn't do in in order to be accepted in the uh, in the region. You know, my spontaneous reaction was, was rather peculiar. So, suddenly, the bridge over troubled water started playing in my ears. You know, R Russia is almost expected to become the bridge of the troubled waters of, of the world for ASEAN, you know, to, so that ASEAN may, may comfortably proceed further. Uh, by the end of his list, I was uh, think, uh, another um, another metaphor was emerging. I started thinking about Russia as the carpet, which has to spread itself in front of ASEAN so that ASEAN can comfortably stand or lie or walk on it and and be absolutely sure that Russia will not misbehave. You know, uh, let me let me just tell you that in my view. Uh, the name of the game between Russia and ASEAN has to be the same as the name of the game in ASEAN itself, where the name of the game is reciprocity. You do to the others what you want others to do to you. 
and that and everything will be okay and and then instead of just talking about doing things you proceed to doing things i i think that so far you know uh, this is this is like saying something in return some th this is not a list of requirements but this is an observation asian is uh, is occupying a position of somebody who is waiting, who is on the receiving end. I, I don't think I can, I can give you a single example of ASEAN proposing something to Russia, offering something to Russia. It is always expecting to be offered. What do we do about that? I mean, if we are looking for an equal relations between the big power and the small powers, let's, let's behave as equals. Let's do it like that. I, I agree. That's why I think I mentioned the word reciprocity at least twice. And Russia has also has offered things to, to ASEAN as well, including defense hardware. Thank you. One, one final remark. I think uh, the definite conclusion is that we have to learn more about each other, and we are prepared to learn. Uh, what we, I say it frankly, what we see on the ASEAN side is a demonstrable lack of expertise on Russia. I mean, in Russia, I can give you a rather long list of people who dev devoted their lives to the studies of, of Southeast Asia. In ASEAN, probably the, the fingers on one hand are enough to list the people for whom studies of Russia is a lifelong occupation. Let us do something about that. I think Dr. Titinin is showing us the way, and thank you very much for doing that. I, th I want to say, finally, that uh, in my whole experience in the ASEAN area, this is probably one of the best gathering dedicated to Russia, ASEAN, Russia in Asia, and all the adjacent subjects. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm tempted to add to all of that, but uh, uh, we're, we're over time. We're over time. But, uh, I think uh, you know we're over time, but I can assure you that we have spent uh, a meaningful uh, worthwhile morning and certainly more entertaining than we could be talking about Thai politics one year after the coup. Uh, we're going to talk about Russia's eastward turn. So please join me in thanking all the speakers, especially those who've come from abroad. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you. Our next event will be on June 17th, June 17th on the Thai economy. Thank you. <laughs>